So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name's Hannah Randall, and I'm the producer of Learning and Events here at the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Centre, which is run by the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. I'm also joined by my colleague, Dr. Chelsea Sambles, our head of research, who is helping with all technical aspects. So she'll be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any questions throughout the event, please put them there. I am also, um, sorry, tonight's event will be recorded and tomorrow you will receive the link with the recording and also a short online survey. Any feedback is really useful for us. We are also a charity, so if you are able to support us, please do. By attending this event, you're already supporting us, but on our website, we have a Just Giving link. So if you're able to, please do. And follow us on social media. We are literally everywhere. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, even on TikTok. So please feel free to follow us. So we have two exciting event series at the moment. This one, which is our Change in Perspectives, of which this is our second event, and also our Academic Keynotes, which is chaired by Chelsea. So it's a great privilege that tonight we are joined by Noemi Lopian and Derek Neiman. Noemi is a Holocaust educator and the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. The story of her father, Dr. Ernst Bornstein, who was a concentration camp survivor, has been published and is it's published under The Long Night, which was translated by Noemi herself. Noemi, welcome. Derek is an author and also the grandson of an SS officer. His book, A Nazi in the Family, was published in 2015 and tells the story of his grandfather and their relationship with Nazism. Though they are descendants from the opposite sides of history, a desire for mutual understanding has brought them together to share their very different experiences. We will now hear from Noemi and Derek, followed by a discussion about the future of Holocaust education, and then we will have time for any questions. Without further ado, I would like to pass over to Noemi and Derek. Thank you very much, Hannah, and good evening, everybody. I'd like to start by saying, ask any question you like when it comes to question time. We, we are trying to be as open, as frank, as honest as possible, and, uh, and we will we'll take anything. But I'd like to begin by going back to an event that happened just before the pandemic. And I was speaking because Noemi couldn't make it at a school in London. And this wasn't just any school. This was a Jewish girls' school. And there was a speaker before me who was a Holocaust survivor. And the girls clearly felt distressed by what the survivor was telling them. And at the end, when she asked, are there any questions? One girl asked, what can we do to prevent this happening? The survivor said something that was quite profound and unexpected. She said, seek out people who are not like you, people from different cultures, different religions, different backgrounds, get to know them, befriend them and understand how they see the world. And now I'm gonna jump back two more years to me talking about my grandfather at a synagogue. At the end of that talk, a lady at the back came to the front and said, I want us to speak together. And that lady was Noemi, and she showed courage, determination, and imagination. So I'll now pass over to my dear friend, Noemi. Thank you, Derek, for that beautiful, eloquent introduction. I'm really grateful. And hello and good evening. I'm just sad that I can't be, or we can't be with you in person because these talks are always slightly different and just to let you know as well our talks are slightly shorter tonight because of time restrictions why should the holocaust matter today after 80 years or so why should they matter to people who might have never met a jewish person what is its relevance today through list by listening to derek and myself you'll hear that human characteristics don't change. We are the same, we're capable of the same. We're all capable of good and evil. 
whether it was then or whether it was today. So that's why. And also because it was the largest single human tragedy that befell mankind. And I add, on both sides, victims and perpetrators. The perpetrators took away their own humanity and that of those to whom they afflicted atrocities. You might by now hear that I have a little twang, and that is because I grew up in Munich, in Bavaria, in Germany. It was a very happy childhood. I was totally unaware of Munich's history in the Second World War, even though both my parents were and are Holocaust survivors. I say were because my dad died when I was 12. How did my dad end up in Munich? He was liberated on the 30th of April 1945 by the Americans close to Munich. It's a beautiful lake called the Tutsinger Lake. He was barely, he barely recognized himself, he describes in the long night, and the Americans who liberated him were repulsed by him and by the people who were with my dad then. He was taken to a hospital for eight months and also to a DP camp in Felderfink, that is a displaced persons camp, where many survivors went after the war in order to almost rehabilitate and get back onto their feet. Some people stayed there many years. My dad subsequently stayed in Munich, and that's how I came to live there, and he studied medicine and dentistry. Whilst being a dentist, he befriended his patient or his patient, patient befriended him. I always say it wouldn't be very strictly kosher today. But this lady became our dear Meme Wolf, our adopted grandmother. I don't know what she did in the war. My mum is vague when I ask her. And nor did we know what her husband did or, or her family. This friendship was very, very special. She became our adopted grandmother and she taught us about life, in particular her life. She was a German Catholic and we celebrated Advent with her every Sunday of the month prior to Christmas and uh, rejoiced in particularly um, around Christmas time in the Christmas markets, the Christmas decorations of the shops and of course the Advent calendar and its magical chocolate. I don't know how my dad, my dad died, like I said, when I was 12 and I came to the long night much later. I don't know how he felt immediately after the war. But I know that uh, once he became a doctor and a dentist, he managed to see humanity for who they were. My father in 1939 was 17 years old when the Germans invaded his hometown of Zawiat, which is in Upper Silesia, Poland. As a 17 year old, initially he was quite excited. He describes that himself by the aeroplanes flying over him and maybe some action in that small boring town. But those thoughts quickly evaporated. His family tried to move to the neighboring town of his grandparents and they were thinking about hiding, but his father quite rightly recognized that it was too late. My father frequently went to hiding in the years of 1939 to 1941. He was also taken to trial camps where he saw atrocities happening then, where old men were, were trampled on, beards were being ripped out, um, people were threatened to be shot um, because of rumours that they had um, uh, killed a German. And so the climate had changed dramatically with the invasion of the Germans in Poland. Of course, there were curfews for the Jewish people. They could no longer go to synagogue, to schools. They were made to wear their star. My grandmother, in particularly my dad's mom, asked him to go into hiding and so that he would be safe. But uh, he was probably an old teenager by then to be rebellious, but he probably had enough. And on the night where he had enough, he, that was the fateful night because the early hours of that morning, the following morning on the 25th of March, Tuesday morning, 1941, 
the Gestapo came to the building and my dad was woken up at 4 a.m. with his parents and siblings. He was the eldest of four um, by noise and tumult downstairs. And he still tried to hide in the neighboring flat, but alas, it wasn't uh, very successful because the hiding place, he didn't have time to make a good hiding place. And so he um, was found by the Germans and beaten by the club with by clubs and taken out and taken to his first labor camp of Brunheide. There he was reunited with his father. And uh, his father actually deteriorated health wise. And my dad managed, and uh, there's much more detail in the long night, of course, managed to get him back to his home, returning to my grandmother and uh, his siblings. Of course, life and home life, even in Zavierch in his hometown, wasn't like my dad remembered and knew it because of all the restrictions and also um, the ghetto and other families joined my grandparents' families. The flat therefore became much smaller. Food was scarce. There was no work, no jobs. Minute by minute, second by second, even at home, they feared for their life. They were no longer safe. They were at risk of being denounced by the Judenrat. Um, maybe later I can explain what that is. And uh, they were subsequently in 1943, his, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, my father's youngest sister, Noemi, his name I carry, and his little brother, Yehuda, were taken to Auschwitz in 1943, where they were gassed and burnt. My father, after Grunheide, was in six more labor and concentration camp over four and a half years. I grew up with Die Lange Nacht on the bookshelf, and in particular, I remember it more when we moved to England, which we did a year after my father died. Uh, when I was 13, we moved to Manchester. And my mum is French. And her lounge, I'm not saying that all French people's lounge are ornate, but my mum's lounge is quite ornate with a lot of knickknacks. But the long night, Die Lange Nacht, had a place on its own. I also grew up not knowing my mum had a story. I only found that out about 11, 12 years ago now, or a bit more, when my friend asked me for the Jewish uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, Yom HaShoah, in April, what your mother must have a story and that's when i began to dig with her help and so we found out that uh, my mum was french and she too was forced to move at the outbreak of war in 1939 but that wasn't only jewish people that was non-jewish people as well because of the invasion of the germans and they were evacuated from strasbourg which is at the french german border to the southwest of france saint junien and uh, little Renee, my mum was five then, and she loved life there. There seemed to be a lot of outdoor life and freedom. For my grandmother, it was much harder. My grandfather had joined the French army for a year, and she was on her own with three young children. Uh, Helen, her older sister, was then seven, my mum five, and the younger brother, Joey, nine. As time passed, even though this was uh, the protected zone, saint Junien the Gestapo still made their presence known, and so much so that entire families appear, disappeared overnight, and people witnessed children literally being picked up, the, picked up and taken away on the streets. My grandparents were approached by friends who had connections with the French underground, Le Maquis, and they were encouraged to send their children away to Switzerland to safety. My grandparents were reluctant, but by May 1944, the climate in saint Junior had changed dramatically. It was oppressive. They weren't allowed to go to schools anymore, the children, no synagogues. Uh, my grandfather had returned by then, but had no job. And the family had frequently gone into hiding too. My mum was picked up in May together with her sister and younger brother. By then the children, my mum was 10, her older sister 13, her younger brother Joey nine. And they were taken around France. Initially, they were just the three of them. When they went to the convent, they became five. And then as they traveled through France, their group grew up to a group of 32 children. 
they came to when they arrived in Lyon, they had to hide underground because Lyon was being bombed by the Allies, the station of Lyon, La Garde du Perrache. And they stayed there a few days. Subsequently, they were going to go on a train to Annecy, which is closer to Switzerland. Before embarking on the train, the group leader said to beware of anybody in uniform, not to draw any attention, not to uh, speak or engage. And that's always shocked me because I grew up knowing that people of uniform would be my protectors, be it the police, be it nurses, be it soldiers. In little Rene's case, it was the inverse. They were the people that were going to hurt, harm and do worse. Renee told me, my mum, she reported herself that she hid on the toilet on the journey from um, Lyon to Annecy. At each stop that they did, they changed group leader. Each time it was a stranger. In Annecy, they were met by a young woman of 22 by then called Marianne Kahn. Marianne had a special magic about her and Renee speaks very warmly still to this day of her. She embraced the children, she reassured the children, and she said, we're, we're, we're close to safety and I'll make sure that you'll be safe. You don't need to worry now, I'll look after you. And she took them first and foremost to the lake in Annecy, which is very beautiful. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. And across the lake are the mountains. And the children, I feel that they saw, smelled and almost touched Switzerland. They felt good, they felt safe. By then it was June, it was a warm summer's day and they were almost excited. For the first time, they thought they might be safe and free. And Marianne felt a little bit like family. Uh, they, they carried on their journey in a van. The van suddenly screeched to a halt because there was a car would block the van in front of them. This was with a few Gestapo soldiers. And then there was a massive lorry in the back with a whole group of Gestapo soldiers with machine rifles and a gun. They asked the responsible to step out. It was Marianne. And she said that, made a white lie to them and said, these are the children of railway workers. And so she um, said, I'm taking them to a holiday camp so that they're free from the bombings and they can enjoy themselves and the parents know that they're safe. So the Gestapo said, take us to this camp. And she did. And when they arrived, the woman was waiting with her arms folded um, on the, uh, on, above some stairs on the doorstep saying, those aren't the children we're expecting. We're, I was expecting a group of boys, not boys and girls. That was when Rene was taken to the prison in Anmas, where she was questioned daily at gunpoint by the Gestapo. Are you Jewish? What's your name? What's your parents' name? Are they Jewish? What's their address? That was most important to them, the address, so they too could get rid of the parents in whichever way they deemed fit. Marianne, after a, a few weeks, was taken away from prison, having first been tortured and the children having seen the end effect of torture of her head swollen twice to twice its size. She was taken away and she was raped and shot not too far away from the prison. The man who saved my mum and her siblings was the Lord Mayor Jean de Faux of Anmas. He, although officially was on the side of the Gestapo, tried to save the children by making a deal with the Gestapo saying, I'll, I'll take care of the kids, you leave the kids to me and I'll enable you to, to get back safely to Germany because by then, some of the railway lines had been bombed and it wasn't easy. And the Gestapo agreed and he managed to get my mum and the 32 children across to Switzerland, to Geneva. Overall, Marianne, a young secular Jewess, saved 200 children. I'm aware of time, and so I will now, in the middle of the story, hand over to Derek. But in the questions and answers, if time permits, I would like to share a passage with you, which I feel is very important, which says that these crimes happened in the midst of built up society. It wasn't a secret. People knew about it. I've seen the prison where my mum was. On either side were residential buildings. And the same with my dad. So over to Derek to tell you 
his side of his story. Many thanks. Thank you, Noemi, and hello again, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and show you some photographs. And I'm going to start not in Nazi Germany, but in Glasgow, Scotland. That's me, the wee boy on the, uh, on the seat, my big brother behind me, and my dad. My dad was German. His sister married a Scottish soldier after the war, and quite some years later, my dad came to Scotland. What did Germany mean to me? Well, Germany was the team that always won every single tournament while Scotland lost everything. It also meant chocolate, chocolate marzipan. I was interested in the Second World War. What did your dad do? I said to my father. He said, well, he was just, he was just a, a bank official, you know, lowly pen pusher. Okay. At 50 years old, I found out who my grandfather really was chance discovery on the internet. I'm going to follow his story now. It started in the most innocuous of circumstances. Yes, he fought in the First World War, but he came back, married his childhood sweetheart, and in other circumstances, they could have lived a blameless life. You look at the tender looks between them. This effectively was a normal couple. A normal couple who began to raise their family in the 1920s. We're in Dortmund, Christmas 1928. My aunt, who eventually ended up in Scotland, and her little brother, Dieter. Idyllic picture, a happy family. Dad, of course, Dad was an old soldier. When, so when the army came to the market square, he took photographs like this one. We don't know how he got involved in the Nazi party. One thing's for sure, he wasn't riding a popular wave. Dortmund was a social democrat, communist city. The Nazis, when Hitler came to power, only got 20% of the vote. My grandfather signed up for the Nazi party in 1930 and took pictures like this, a stormtrooper parade through the city. By the time my grandmother was pregnant with my dad, Adolf Hitler had come to power. And my grandfather, a bank official, yes, certainly, but at night he put on his uniform and became an SS official. He would knock on people's doors and ask them for their political views. And if they didn't match those of the Nazi party, he was supposed to report them to the Gestapo. Now we're in 1935. This is, a, this is an idyllic little picture, isn't it? It's a little family growing up, little happy, smiling children. But look at the buckle on the boy's belt. And look at the coat that Aunt Anna is wearing. They're both part of the Hitler Youth. And my dad in the middle. Being watched by the photographer, my grandfather, who has now lost his job he has no money to pay the rent, but a friend suggests a contact, somebody who went to the same school as him in the Pied Piper town of Harmel. He can get you a job. This influential figure happened to be Heinrich Himmler's deputy in the SS. And like a, Syria, a young man in Britain going to Syria, my grandfather went away to be indoctrinated into the SS. But unlike the young man, a 16, 17, 18 year old who joined ISIS, my grandfather was in his forties. He knew exactly what he was doing. And in those six months of initiation, he was encouraged to mix with others joining the SS, like these friends of his, colleagues of his, drinking partners, he joined up with at least 10 men who went on to become concentration camp commandants. He was mixing with some very, very unpleasant company. One day in the winter of 35, 36, he took this photograph from a tower. It shows the arrival of some SS officers. You can see here that this man is giving the Hitler salute. 
a grandfather is standing in a guard tower on the site of today's Dachau concentration camp. Now we move forward. We're in Berlin. My grandfather is moving up in the world. He has a chauffeur who comes to take him to work. He's been given a house and a beautiful estate on the edge of Berlin, on the, beside the great forest of Grunewald. And now we have four children, including my uncle Eki in the middle, the only one of the four still alive today. Well, what were their parents doing? They were having a party, of course. This drunken photograph shows the SS at play. And this was an estate built for the SS. They're celebrating New Year's Eve, maybe six, seven weeks after Kristallnacht, when the synagogues of Berlin burned and people were beaten, murdered, taken to concentration camps. There is a dissonance in the something like 550 photographs, family photographs, between what was happening in the outside world and this loving, affectionate family. There's my aunt on the right with some kind of wardrobe malfunction. My dad at the front, hitching up his lederhosen so hard, it's amazing he managed to have two sons. And yet, when this photograph's being taken, Noemi's father, is being arrested. And in the center of Berlin, the bombs are raining down. People are losing their houses and sometimes their lives. After I found out who my grandfather really was, I asked my dad, what was, what was your father like? He told me he was a distant man. He was always going away on business trips. And as soon as he came back, he was preparing to go on another one. The rest of the time, he pottered around in the garden as he did here in the summer of 1944. For young men in Berlin, the changing fortunes in the war were bad news. My uncle Dieter at the age of 17 ended his education. He went to man the guns to fire at the bombers coming overhead. And one night, when his best friend had his head blown off, he decided to go and fight. And he joined the Panzers, the tank regiment, where the chances of survival were 5%. This is him pictured Christmas 1944, the last photograph of Dieter. At the end of March, with the Russians advancing from the east, my grandfather arrived home after work and announced that the office was being relocated to the Alps. Several SS families traveled together down the length of Germany, and they arrived for a few days at a place that my grandfather knew very well. They arrived at Dachau. My wife and I followed that same route some 70 years later. Before we went, I told my dad that we were going to Dachau. He told me a story, and this is quite a shocking, so I apologize for this. He was slipping into dementia, and people with dementia sometimes tell secrets that they've kept all their lives. My dad told me that the family was housed in a barracks hut. He was in a bunk bed, his parents at the window. They were looking out at a long, low building with a tall chimney. His mother said, you know what they're doing there? His father said, no. She said, well, they're killing them. They're killing the Jews and burning their bodies. His father said, nah, they wouldn't do that. She said, of course they would. Can't you smell the flesh? By then I knew who my grandfather was. I knew that his business trips, his factories were concentration camps and that his workers were people who were turned into slave laborers. I went into the archives of Dachau and spoke to their historians and asked if it was conceivable 
that my grandfather could be going to these places of horror, see skeletal figures, perhaps beatings and bodies, and not comprehend what was happening and the scale of what was happening. They said it was impossible. I stepped outside, my wife took my, this photograph, and I have no memory of it. That's, that's the difficult bit. The family left for the Alps as we did at the very same time of year with patchy snow on the ground. They went to a hut at the very top of this valley and there they waited and waited. One day my dad watched an American Jeep come up this track with four heavily armed American soldiers. They jumped out, they grabbed his, my dad's sister, stuck a gun in her back and said, show us your Nazis. And so my dad watched as his father and the other Nazi officers were beaten up and taken away. And they didn't see them again for another three years. Where could the rest of the family go? The war had ended the day before. They went to the nearest town liberated by the Americans. And an American soldier took this photograph. My dad wearing an American soldier's helmet. My uncle Eki there on the right, wearing a little paper hat that the soldiers had made for the kids. After the war, my grandfather was released and he and my grandmother lived in a cramped flat in Harmel with his in-laws. And there they died before I was born. They were buried in a cemetery opposite the Jewish cemetery. Through researching this story and writing my book, there were two people who kept me going. One was a German of Harmel itself called Bernhardt. His father had committed atrocities in, in Poland and Bernhardt could accept what his father had done, but he couldn't accept that his father told him, I would do it again. When Bernhard retired as a history teacher, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to teaching the children of Harmel and the surrounding villages about the Jewish communities who had lived there before Hitler, and even persuaded their parents to restore gravestones that had been smashed by the Nazis. My, my other inspiration was the little boy in the paper hat. Uncle Eki, still in Germany, he and his wife read the draft of my book and he said to me, I find this very hard, but it is true and you must tell this story. And right now the pair of them are arranging for Noemi and I to speak in Germany when it's safe to do so. So we end up with two families. One trying to hush things away, pretend it didn't happen, forget the past, learn nothing. The other, Noemi's family, her parents willing to speak and tell of this terrible story, and their daughter willing to carry on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Um, incredible stories, both. So the theme of this event is not only to hear from wonderful Derek and Naomi, um, but also to consider the future of Holocaust education going forward. Uh, and that is why we titled it, Who Will Tell the Story? Because at the moment and in the past, it has been the survivors, but as we all know, time goes by and survivors become fewer and fewer in number. And one day in the not very distant future, there won't be any left. So what do we do next? And that's what we're gonna discuss. But first of all, I'd like to ask Nome and Derek, why do you choose to tell your stories together? The two stories on the different sides of the war, essentially, why together? Noemi, you initiated this. Would you, would you, would you like, like to start? I, I thought it would um, 
get heard so much more initially it was quite superficial that uh, it would be almost a sensationalism to have these two extremes although although we're not exactly victim and perpetrator and then it can be so level so many so many layers and nuanced because um i'm a jew by accident of birth like Derek is the grandson of a Nazi by accident of birth. And it's also showing in the end, I discovered what ordinary people are capable of. And it's very important to look at Hitler himself as an ordinary person, because if we miss that, then we don't show the world that every human being is capable of that. And then the more nuanced thing, how in part, when you go into the story, they could be, Nazis during the day, as you've heard from Derek, and then be husbands and fathers and lovers at night. And so it's very important and it's powerful when Derek, from his origin, says, in essence, although I'm oversimplifying, that this is wrong to do and standing next to me. And also showing that both of us, with our different backgrounds, can not only metaphorically but also literally walk across the bridge and stand side by side. And that has implications for today and for the future and for always. And to add to what Noemi has said, it, it's been a learning experience for us. And we've learned over the three years that we've been speaking together to, to trust each other. And, and that means raising difficult things with each other. We're asking people to cross bridges. We couldn't possibly do that with any sense of justification unless we were prepared to demonstrate that we were doing that ourselves. And there are things that I've said that, that have offended Noemi, and she's had the, the trust in me to speak up and say, I don't like that. Um, so it, it's every time we speak, we learn something else. We, we learn from, from speaking to schools, to universities, to, to anybody, to, to, to people who are Jewish, to people who are German, to people from different backgrounds. It, it's a continuing process. And it gives hope. It gives hope for people that, that people from different backgrounds can come together and can show kindness, tolerance, understanding. Yeah, absolutely. So I think between the three of us, I as a Holocaust educator in a museum, Naomi as a second generation and Derek as a third generation, we cover quite a big spectrum of Holocaust educators. How do you envisage Holocaust education changing once we lose the survivor communities themselves? I think um, personal stories will be always very powerful. But I think it will have to be a sort of multi-pronged approach in education. So starting perhaps young in primary school, obviously uh, age appropriate and it can be done. I've been to primary schools myself and speak about basics again, speak about being uh, in Yiddish, they say being a mensch, being decent and kind and, you know, teaching you about your own inner conscience, uh, conscience. and it's with bullying and things that children can relate to. And I've been to a local school, uh, primary school, and the kids were so well educated on the Holocaust. It was fascinating. Um, they asked loads of questions. And one that stuck with me um, was a young girl who looked um, beautifully airy and blonde and blue eyed. And she said, so what did the girls, what did the Jews, I mean the girls, what did the Jews do that Hitler did this to them? And that was almost feeding into an anti-Semitic language, not conscious from her at all, but thinking that if, if these people were treated like that, that's a punishment or whatever she'd known. And if you get punished, you must have done something. So it's important to get the idea across that this happened simply because they belonged to this group. And I think that, and I think to go to concentration camp sites are very important, the visits, because... Uh, you get a totally new perspective, even though they're not exactly how they were then. They've been sanitized as well and made more palatable. 
well, that's important. Museums are important. It's another experience. So I think we have to do it at different times. It's almost a process and keep doing it in different times of people's lives. And I think that I think there's a real challenge for, for, for you, Hannah, and for, well, for all of us as, as Holocaust educators to, to as Noemi says, to, to recognize that history is about people. And I think particularly for children, you need, you need to build stories where the children can get some understanding about how people behave and why they behave. I remember talking to a school and there was a whole drama class there. And the drama teacher came up to me at the end and said, I, I invited my kids to, 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 to listen to you because I wanted them to understand the mind of a, of a perpetrator and to realize that they're not simply evil people, they're complex people with, with conflicting emotions. Yeah, absolutely. I've been teaching a class today in a workshop called Humanizing the Holocaust. And ultimately, I think that phrase is the most important thing going forward. We humanize the Holocaust, both victims and perpetrators. And only through doing that can we at least hope to understand what happened. So what do you think then is gained by the second and third generations telling the story? I think there is a sense for the audience of, of reaching into the history. To, to actually be speaking to people who have a connection. Um, I, 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 the, you know, the, the, it does have a, a very strong attraction. Yeah, Noemi, no, I mean, your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with that. But I think anybody can do it. Anybody who feels passionate to do for the good of humanity can, can do it. But uh, maybe for the audience, it's more attractive to have the direct, li direct link. But even you know, people who have heard survivor stories can become their ambassador and can pass them, can pass them on. That can just be as powerful. If you're a good storyteller, then you can tell the story of the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, what do you think then is the biggest challenge for Holocaust education going forward? For me, it's not to other it, to stop othering it, to stop putting it into religious education, stop putting it into history or some of the forward thinking schools into the citizenship. It's all the time othering it, mm -hmm. making it into a separate thing. You actually have to explain to people that um, this was an end effect. You know, you hear it's almost become cliched now. It didn't start with the Holocaust. You'll hear many people in Holocaust education say, that's making people aware of free speech. Yes, Tarek and I encourage it. But free speech with, where's the border between free speech and incitement of hatred? And what can incitement of hatred do? And so that's why I think I would love to see the curriculum being changed. And that's the challenge for you, Hannah, to help the young people how to do that and put it into a general sort of syllabus to be a decent human being, basically. And so that you think before you act. And Derek and I, usually Derek says, I'm taking it away from you, Derek, is to empower our youth to speak up and speak out and not to be a stand, uh, bystander, but to recognize that that's not easy, that's really difficult. And sometimes you can do it with a smile or a piece of paper if you're not brave enough, or to think maybe in class, situations how it can be done you know not everybody feels good all the time we are inherently prejudiced we don't like the different we don't like the other and social media platforms prove that time and time again they give us the same so we think the same and we feel comfy in the same environment i do um so i think we really have to change our whole education system but human stories like derek said history through human is the only way to teach the holocaust and actually we had students from Germany yesterday and in a previous talk we said they get so much Holocaust over uh, education, it's almost an overkill. They're sick of it and some make fun of it. And I always ask, do they have these personal stories? And I know it's not evidence-based, it's more anecdotal, it's not big enough as some, but these students said they don't hear that sort of talk. 
So it's important. I, I just I just add that in some respects, I think Holocaust education, although it's retreating in time, I think in some respects it's actually easier to teach now. And uh, and for, for once this year, I'm going to thank Donald Trump because here is evidence of a civilized country sliding towards authoritarianism and a supremacist mentality. Now that's always one of, been one of the challenges. How, can, how could Germany slide into the Holocaust? And, and us sitting in, in Britain, perhaps we feel a bit smug and say it couldn't happen here, but we have an example across the, the, across the, um, the Atlantic. We have examples in Hungary, in Poland, in Turkey, of authoritarians who are oppressing minorities whether they be Jews, whether they be homosexuals, whether they be black, whatever, whether they're Muslim, you know, it's happening in the world and it's, it's accelerated in the years since, since Noemi and I produced our books. There's a relevance, there's a real relevance. There's a relevance in, in what's happening and there is the relevance in genocides all over the world that have in essence a common, a commonality, a hatred of others, and a desire to, to foster that hatred. Before we open the floor to um, audience questions, I've just got one final question from me, um, mainly to Noemi, but Derek, you might have an opinion too. Um, Noemi, how does your mum feel about you speaking with Derek? That's a really good question. And that was the first person I turned to probably after asking Derek first, because I'm always impulsive and trigger, finger happy, trigger happy. And I said to my mum, what do you think? And she gave me uh, her blessing. She endorsed it. And not only that, Derek's been to visit my mum. My sister was there at the time and uh, my mum is, is for it. The one time I can, shall I quickly say that Derek? about yeah, go ahead. Mm. so the one time when I climbed the bridge and only admitted it to Derek not so long ago was um the second time we met the first time was just to say hello and I'd like to do that and the second time was well how are we going to do that and Derek's wife came with who has become a dear friend of, uh, of mine and um tried to set it up had her laptop ready and put up uh innocently and benignly a picture of Derek's grandfather next to my dad and um, I felt very strange very not I felt almost unwell um, overwhelmed I didn't like what I saw I can't even today maybe even put it into words but I was I was shocked at myself because as you know I asked uh, for this Liaison Dangereuse, I reached out to Derek, nobody made me, nobody forced me, I wanted it. And yet I realized how my emotions tailed way behind my intellect. And I too had to come to terms with this. Maybe it felt disrespectful to my dad, I didn't have a chance to ask my dad. Um, but Sarah was so sensitive, she saw that I must have gone red or looked very uncomfortable and asked me what was the matter. And I just said, oh, I don't feel comfortable with the picture. So. She showed me extreme kindness and understanding and didn't probe me then to explain because I couldn't explain it very well. So I recognize that what I ask of others, I have to ask of myself and go on the, on the same journey. So we do have some questions from the audience. Um, first question from Harriet is, Derek, how have the photos that you have survived and how did they come to you? Well, they were hidden for, for decades. My aunt um, went to her parents' flat when they died, took all the photographs and hid them, hid them from her siblings and died without her siblings know the, knowing they even existed. However, the, the, the very contentious photographs, the, the ones that we saw of, of Stormtrooper Parade and, and from Dachau, the family left Berlin and took all their prints with them. However, 
they may have destroyed all the Nazi incriminating pictures when they got back to Harmel, but the negatives survived in the cellar and a Jewish lady was given their house after the war and eventually she died and her son met my uncle and gave him the negatives. So quite, quite a journey. Yeah, wow. Um, so we have a question from Ron. Um, so his question is, my question concerns how non-Jewish people can sensitively communicate about this complex topic. He has just started um, a social art project based on the diaries of Victor Klemperer. And he would like to know if there are any topics he should avoid or those he should be sure to include. I think Victor Klemper is, is a fantastic example because I don't think anybody with any decency could read that book and not sit there every 10 minutes and say, how could anyone do this to these people? Um, so I, I, I don't have any problems with it. No, I think it's, I think it's a very powerful book. And I think it's very well, very well written and very balanced. Um. Martin Hyman has asked, well, it's more of a comment and a question, but inevitably some of the content of the stories will be lost with each passing generation. How can the second and the subsequent generations keep the stories real and relevant? I'll certainly write a book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I think keep keep researching and and now with 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 recordings, you know, this, this, this program is being recorded, there, there will be evidence for future generations surviving and the questions that, that you are asking, we are answering and that's, that's widening everybody's knowledge and everybody's understanding. Um, we've got a question from, I believe it's Marley, um, saying, do you both speak in schools? Um, and if so, how can that be arranged? Very, yeah, very, very happy to. So perhaps if you if you get in touch with, uh, can you get in touch with you, Hannah? And Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you get in touch with us um, at the Holocaust Centre on our website, we can then pass on information. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a question from Chelsea. Um, when you both deliver this fascinating talk, what response do you usually get from the audience, particularly young people who may have either Holocaust survivors or Nazi perpetrators in their ancestry? Do you want to take that? Yeah, the, the, the one where that is in my memory is one of the more recent ones at Oxford where a young Jewish man came up to me and he, he looked white, almost ashen faced that he was in the presence of the two of us. And I think he needed time to process it. Um, in schools, we've recently have also had negative experience, which perhaps shows the climate that uh, one girl year nine was um, chatting, eyeballing me the whole time grinning at me triumphantly and chatting and giggling to her friend. And I felt that was like making a public statement. I'm not listening to anything you have to say. Um, and uh, over to Derek, because he had also fascinating, we had fascinating responses last night, really, at our talk, Derek. Yes, yes, we did. Um, after the talk had finished, um, Noemi had to go back to Manchester, but I, I stayed in, in Cambridge and was joined by a number of young Germans who were clearly suffering anguish from the idea of collective guilt. And they, they asked about guilt. And, and, and I said that guilt is a very, very dangerous emotion because guilt can turn to resentment and resentment will actually undo any good that guilt might have. So I was encouraging them and, and Germany for that matter, although, although the Chancellor wasn't listening, um, encouraging Germany to, to, to create a distance between what was done by a generation that is no longer about 
and a country being responsible to, to pre prevent this happening. Now, Germany does it brilliantly, but in, in coming to terms with its past, but there's still a fundamental problem with a country, a people that have no pride in their identity. And that, that's a very dangerous thing. And it's something that's, that's, that fuels the ADF and the right-wing organizations. You know, we are proud of our past. We are proud of our, our Nazi empire. So th th that's quite dangerous. It applies in the, in the UK as well. We, we need to come to terms with what we did in slavery. We, we are not, and the United States are not mature democracies in facing up to our past. We sit too comfortably thinking that our colonial empire makes us exceptional. It doesn't. Absolutely. Um, so one final question um, from Tara. So Tara is a postgraduate stu uh, student who is hoping to go into Holocaust education. Um, she asks, is there a certain age that you believe students should begin learning about Holocaust, the Holocaust? So I think you can start in primary school. Like I said, as long as you make it age appropriate with the stories and don't go into the depths of it. But first of all, teach about basics, human kindness, human decency, what it is to be a good person. Um, understanding, making kids understand that it's not always easy. And then you can teach a bit of the history and, and take a story that's age appropriate from that era. And I believe in telling true stories rather than fictionalized like the boy in the striped pajamas. Uh, even though I had this discussion with my husband, he said, oh, it's a great film. I said, no, <laughs> it might be a great film and it might be a great story, but um, to teach the Holocaust on an untrue story feeds the subconscious of that person in something that it wasn't true and feeds into the denial. So I think we have so much material around that there's no excuse really. And yeah, and then layer it, you know, and then repeat it um, if we can with my dream syllabus sort of throughout time. Don't uh, do overflow, make people sick with it, but have discussions, have uh, philosophical outlooks, which in whichever subject you can and just allow people to think and keep sticking and reinforcing the goodness for a simplistic way. Yeah, I will completely echo that as a primary school teacher myself, and we have primary schools coming to the uh, centre. But we also get asked quite often, aren't they too young? Um, they're not socially emotional, they're not able to comprehend yet. My argument is that even if the only thing they take away is that it's wrong to pick on someone because of their skin colour, their hair colour, whatever it might be, how trivial it may be, then I've done my job right in that in that circumstance and I think at the end of the day that's what holocaust education is for isn't it it's to stop picking on or oh, discrimination happening now I'm just aware of the time um, I would like to say thank you to both Naomi and Derek it has been a brilliant event thank you so much um, I'd also like to say thank you to everyone in the audience who have sent in questions and comments. Um, I will make sure Derek and Naomi both get to see all the comments. Um, and then also thank you to Chelsea for being um, so wonderful on the tech side of things. Um, as mentioned, tomorrow we will send out the recording of this event if you want to watch again or share with friends, family, colleagues. And we will also send um, a short survey out. Um, and remember, we do have more events planned, more in this series. The next event in the Changing Perspective series is on Holocaust denial and the far right today, um, which is at the end of February. And forgive me, but I can't remember which one is next for the academic keynotes. There's so many, um, but they're all wonderful and they're all on our website. Um, but without further ado, I would like to say thank you very much for attending and have a lovely evening, whatever you go on to do. Um, good night. Thank you.